So I, I don't have a picture of Monell, but the reason they would have remembered walking past it is because we have a big gold nose out front. <laughs> um, well, in this sort of diverse array of talks, I think mine is perhaps the oddest. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about taste and smell in aging. And most of the research that I'll be presenting has been supported by the NIH through the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. So everyone expects the senses of vision and audition to dim with age, uh, but a similar decline in the ability to taste or appreciate the flavor of food doesn't similarly pervade the popular consciousness. However, um, as this quote from the Hebrew Bible demonstrates, the fact of such diminution has in fact be re been recognized for thousands of years. So just to, to give you a quick outline of what I'll be talking about, I'll first touch on some of the relationships between smell and taste, their similarities, differences, and how they overlap. Um, I'll then focus individually on olfaction and gustation and discuss some of the physiological and perceptual changes that we see with age. And finally, I will uh, talk about the implications of these changes for nutrition, quality of life, and healthy aging. Uh, I'm not a nutritional expert by any means, and there's actually little evidence linking specific nutritional deficits to age-related changes in smell and taste. However, changes in the chemical senses can certainly have nutritional implications, and, uh, and as you'll see, implications possibly for healthy aging. And so that's how I hope to tie my presentation to the general theme of this workshop. So first, similarities. Uh, both smell and taste receptors are there to interact with and respond to chemical stimuli. And both of these senses are consequently susceptible to damage from toxic chemicals. And finally, uh, because of that susceptibility, both must rely on continuous replacement of the receptor cells throughout life to maintain function. On the other hand, smell and taste have completely or completely different peripheral physiological systems. They have different types of receptors that respond by and large to different types of chemicals, and they have very different neural pathways to the brain. Moreover, they, ha they have different cell types that express those receptors. In olfaction, the receptor cells are actually primary neurons. Uh, in taste, they're modified epithelial cells, and that has implications for the ease of regeneration. Nonetheless, taste and smell overlap in important ways as well. Uh, despite the fact that they respond to different types of chemicals, uh, both are in fact stim stimulated by chemicals held in the oral cavity. The volatile molecules from food and drink flow up the back of the throat to the nasal cavity, where soluble molecules dissolve in saliva and enter the pores of taste buds. Moreover, despite striking difference in, differences in their peripheral pathways, the projection sites for smell and taste in the brain overlap considerably. So first I just should note that there is actually a third chemosensory system that also operates in the oral and nasal cavities, and that's the trigeminal or chem chemesthetic sense. Uh, and I'm not going to address that in this talk, but these particular slides uh, display the central projection pathways for that system together with those of smell and taste. So the point of these first scans is just to show you the um, primary olfactory and gustatory projection sites, which is the uh, piriform cortex in olfaction, and these last two are, are more ventral and more dorsal views of the insula cortex cortices for uh, taste. And then they also, uh, both smell and taste, have secondary projection sites to the orbitofrontal cortex. 
But the same cortices that are responsible for perceiving the individual chemical senses also serve as points of integration. And that's what's shown by the mix of colors in each of these areas. It's less noticeable in the piriform cortex for olfaction. Um, it obviously, you can see the mix of colors in the orbital frontal cortex, which is a secondary relay for both systems. But strikingly, particularly in the ventral portion of the insula cortices, there is considerable overlap between smell and taste projections. And that um, is probably what underlies the phenomena that people tend to perceive all flavor sensations as coming from their oral cavity, even though a substantial portion of them are coming from their nasal cavity. So turning specifically to smell, anatomy, physiology, and perception, the uh, olfactory neuroepithelium, uh, this is not a very good angle for me to see what I'm doing, but it's located in a small area in the upper part, oh, is that working? Uh, of the nasal cavity, it's in blue there, I believe. Um, and then the olfactory neurons, you have millions of them in those small patches of tissue. And as I said, these are really primary brain cells that just happen to originate outside the brain. Um, they extend ciliated dendrites, bearing the olfactory receptors into the nasal cavity. This is not working, I don't think. But you can sort of see that in that circle in the middle there. And, um, oh, the red button, okay, got it. Okay, so here are the cilia extending into the nasal cavity. And then each of these neurons travels up through a bony plate called the cribriform and connects directly to the olfactory bulb in the brain. It's believed, well, humans have approximately 350 different types of olfactory receptors. A huge portion of the genome is, is devoted to olfactory receptors. Um, and, but each of these millions of neurons only expresses one of those types of receptors. It's now believed that we can perceive uh, at least a billion different odor qualities based on a combinatorial code that's relayed to the brain. So this is obviously an extremely complex system. And this is just to point out that smell stimuli reach the olfactory, or to show you more specifically how smell stimuli reach the olfactory cavity through two different routes, what's called the orthonasal route, which is what we think of as smelling when we sniff odors in. But also, volatile molecules, as I said, flow from the oral cavity up the back of the throat and stimulate this epithelium as well. And you can get a sense of that, well, when you have a cold, you notice that you can't perceive flavors as well. Uh, but just holding your nose, if you put a jelly belly in your mouth and don't look at the color of it, and your nose is clamped shut, which blocks this retronasal flow of air, all you can tell is that the thing is sweet. It's only when you open your nose up that you can tell whether it's cherry or vanilla or chocolate. So a, a relatively unique property of the olfactory system is, in fact, this continuous turnover of neurons. Um, occurs in a few other places in the brain, but very few. And one of those is related to smell. At any given time, there are um, olfactory neurons at different stages of development in the epithelium. Um, there are basal cells which have yet to commit to becoming neurons. They also are capable of becoming supporting cells. Uh, there are immature cells that do not have dendrites or connecting axons, but are committed to becoming neurons. There are mature cells that extend dendrites and cilia-bearing receptors into the nasal cavity and that connect back to the brain. And then there are dying cells. Um, without this rather metabolically expensive process, it's likely that we would all lose substantial olfactory sensitivity uh, pretty early in life. 
However, uh, there is evidence that this neurogenesis, although it continues into old age, becomes less efficient. And in fact, there have been repeated demonstrations of declines in olfactory ability with age, which is illustrated here by a decline in the ability to identify odor qualities beginning in about the seventh decade and then accelerating with increasing age. And you might also note that uh, this is much more pronounced in men than in women. Interestingly, although advanced, by advanced stage, this loss tends to be more or less across the board, there is some suggestion from a joint study by a Monell scientist in the National Geographic that perception of some odors decays earlier than others. Uh, most notably in this study, the smell of the methyl mercaptans, which are what are added to natural gas so that it can be detected. Uh, unfortunately, the ability to detect it seems to begin to decline relatively early in life and decline very rapidly compared to some of these other odors that were included. So general loss of function is a problem for a substantial portion of our older population, uh, especially men, as illustrated in these numbers, which came from a U.S. population-based study, which found almost 30 percent of adults over the age of 50 suffer from some diminution in smell. And by the age of 80, over two-thirds of men have a measurable olfactory loss. I'll turn now to taste um, and see if we might show you a little bit prettier picture. Taste, in contrast to smell, which as I said, we perceive billions of odor qualities, we perceive a very limited number of taste qualities. There are currently only five that are kind of universally accepted basic taste, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, or savory taste characterized by monosodium glutamate. Um, there, there is increasing evidence to suggest that there may be gustatory receptors for fatty acids and possibly for calcium as well. But of the five canonical tastes, three of them, sweet, bitter, and umami, are encoded by sort of traditional lock and key G protein coupled receptors. Uh, in the case of sweet, there appears to be only a single receptor, although we taste a lot of different uh, configurations of, of chemical stimuli as sweet. A, a single receptor seems to be responding to them all. Uh, in, and that's true of umami as well. In, uh, for bitter taste, humans have about 25 different receptors. And so humans can vary considerably in their sensitivity to specific bitters. Sour and salty tastes seem to be uh, rely on ion channels, and those have yet to be fully elucidated. Now, it's a common misperception, which actually you can still find in textbooks nowadays, that the perception of the different taste qualities is located to specific areas of the tongue. Um, that's just not true. All parts of the tongue that contain taste receptors show some degree of sensitivity to all of the basic taste. So where are these receptors? So the receptor organs or taste buds are mostly found on the tongue in three types of papillae, the fungi form, which are on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, the foliate, which are slits along the back edges of the tongue, and the circumvallate at the very back of the tongue. Uh, but buds are also found in the palate and in the throat. These buds are onion-shaped structures that can, are comprised of 50 to 100 cells, most of which extend uh, projections through the opening of the taste bud called the taste pore, and that's where most of the interaction with chemical stimuli, although not all of it, takes place. Um, these cells, like the olfactory neurons, are continuously replaced 
the replacement process is much faster than in smell. It these turn over every 10 to 14 days. Um, and so what happens is progenitor cells, which are labeled here uh, in green, turn into uh, new cell types, some of which are receptor cells, and there's, a, as I said, this continuous turnover of function. So the process is, isn't as complex as of replacing olfactory neurons. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is potential for disruption, and some work that we have done at Monell in, indicates that, in fact, there is a significant reduction in the number of progenitor cells um, at least in aged mice, and a reduction in the density of taste buds. So again, the green are the progenitor cells. Here's a young mouse, and you can see how sp much more sparsely distributed these progenitor cells are in the old mouse, and the same thing with the red, uh, actually, uh, taste buds. But despite these indications of age-related uh, physiological changes in taste at the periphery, uh, perceptual measures of, of, of taste function, at least whole mouth measures, don't show substantial declines with age. And those that are observed tend to be quality-specific, as shown here with taste intensity ratings of sweet, which hardly change at all with age versus bitter, which does decline substantially. Um, and as because of the range of bitter qualities or bitter receptors available, we also see compound-specific changes um, in bitter. So urea doesn't, the bitterness of urea doesn't shift much at all between the young and elderly, whereas that of quinine declines substantially. But there is a caveat to this generally rosy picture of taste and aging, and that is the occurrence of localized or spotty losses. Um, several studies have suggested that the elderly are particularly susceptible to localized losses on the tongue. And while in many and probably most cases this doesn't present a, a real perceptual problem since there can be compensation from other areas, in some cases, this kind of loss is associated with the development of phantom taste sensations, and it also may render individuals more vulnerable to generalized taste loss when they experience insults from uh, medications, viral infections, or bacterial infections. So this could become a more significant concern as our population ages. Okay, finally, I want to turn to nutrition and quality of life and healthy aging. So the impact of chemosensory dysfunction, smell disorders have a very broad impact on many areas of life. The biggest complaint that people with smell loss have is diminished food enjoyment, um, which can lead to altered dietary patterns. In fact, people with smell losses often increase their use of salt and of sugar because they can still taste those things. Um, there are also increased safety concerns, the ability to detect spoiled foods, fire, gas leaks, declines. Uh, there are personal hygiene concerns because they can't smell their body odor anymore. And uh, for some people, there are job performance issues. Uh, chefs are an obvious example, but there are a lot of uh, chemical workers, firemen, policemen, who need to be able to smell the environment around them. Taste disorders, except for food enjoyment, and in the case of chefs, uh, job concerns, don't have the same broad quality of life issues that uh, are presented by smell disorders. But we have found in our clinic that taste disorders cause greater intake difficulties uh, and have greater negative impact on affect than do smell disorders. It's interesting to talk to people with a true taste disorder. Uh, 
People with smell problems don't enjoy food as much, but they may actually eat more to try to get satisfaction, or they may lose weight. People with taste problems have trouble swallowing food. And this is illustrated in the responses to a question we pose to patients and healthy controls of just about how well they've maintained their body weight for the preceding two years. And as you can see, I mean, people with primary smell disorders are more likely to lose weight than, or somewhat more likely to lose weight than, than controls. But the people with the taste problems, 60% of them lose weight. Uh, in terms of general enjoyment of life, um, again, there's some in, there's a fairly substantial decline among people with smell disorders in terms of really being able to enjoy life fully. Uh, but it's a huge decline for people with taste disorders. And finally, people with taste disorders are more likely to show moderate to severe depression as measured by the sh short form of the back depression inventory. Thus, while both smell and taste dysfunction substantially impact quality of life, taste dysfunction in particular may negatively affect nutriture. On the other hand, there are three recent studies that I want to end with which suggest that smell dysfunction may not just impact quality of life, but may in fact provide a key indicator of all-cause mortality in older populations, and thus uh, a surrogate measure of healthy aging. So the first of these studies was conducted by Wilson et al. and published in 2011. It was based on a little over 1,100 individuals, mean age of about 80, who had completed olfactory testing as part of their annual clinical evaluations in the Rush Memory and Aging Study project in Chicago. This, they did exclude from this group anyone who met the criteria for dementia or had a history of Parkinson's disease, both of which are associated with smell loss. Uh, and they used a 12-item brief identification test for olfactory assessment. The observation period was about four years, and during that time, a little over 300 people died. And those with impaired olfactory function were about 36% more likely to, uh, to die than those with relatively good olfactory function. And that relationship held even when proportional uh, hazards models were adjusted for potentially confounding effects, including age, sex, education level, naming ability, disability score, cardiovascular risk factors and conditions, uh, cognitive, social, and physical activity, and depressive symptoms. So it was a, it was a strong relationship, uh, independent relationship. Now the second study was by a group uh, in Australia, um, and they were testing about a little over 1,600 participants in uh, the Blue Mountain Eye Study in Sydney. They used an eight-item identification test um, and tested uh, these people about five years after that, or followed these people about five years after that. Um, and again, what, what they saw was participants with any degree of olfactory uh, impairment had a 67% higher risk of all-cause mortality than those without. And as you can see here, that risk increased uh, with increasing levels of olfactory impairment. Now, there is a caveat to this. In this study, the associate, the, they controlled for a lot of factors, but they did find that the association with olfactory impairment and mortality was not completely independent of cognitive impairment as measured by the mini mental state. Uh, but not all of these, their subjects were tested with the mini mental state, and so in order to do that analysis, they had to reduce their sample size by 15%. So the final study, which some of you may have actually heard of because it's received uh, a fair amount of media attention, uh, as, as if it were a novel finding, but <laughs> that's, uh, which is obviously not. But so this appeared in um, PLOS 1, and um, it's based on a nationally representative sample of a little over 3,000 people who um, were participating in the National Social Life, Health, and Aging Project in the states. 
And they used a five item odor identification test. I keep sort of cutting it down. So controlling for demographic factors as well as many common mortality risk factors, the authors reported that mortality risk for anosmic older adults, you can see this best in panel B, these are the complete anosmics, is about three times that of normosmic individuals. Um, but it's not, you don't have to be anosmic. There's, there's a kind of dose response, a gradual, with increasing degree of, of olfactory impairment, a gradual increase in mortality risk. Um, <clears throat> and in this study, controlling for cognitive function, although they specifically used, were, were looking at memory and mental arithmetic using this short portable mental status questionnaire, it did have a small, um, but significant diminution on the effect of the uh, of anosmia on, on mortality, but it did not eliminate it. Thus, I, you know, I think we can say that on the basis of those three studies, uh, there's really pretty strong evidence that declines in olfactory function can provide a marker for mortality risk. So just to quickly summarize, smell and taste are both vulnerable to damage from uh, inter because of interactions between their receptors and the chemical stimuli that they are there to detect. Both systems rely on continuous regeneration of the receptor cells in order to maintain function. That process can be disrupted in aging and have substantial impl implications for food choice, nutrition, and quality of life. And at least in the case of, cell, of smell, the degree of disruption perhaps as a reflection of general regenerative capacity, may provide a marker for healthy aging. So thank you very much.